All right. It's great to see everybody. I think it's one of the great benefits of, uh, I mean, if we can find one for the, for, there we go. It's great to see everybody. One of the few benefits of this uh, situation is uh, we get to do events like this and see everybody at the same time, even if it is in all our little home offices. But it's uh, it's, it's great to be with everyone, and this is going to be a, a really fun event. Uh, we've got a lot of firepower on the on the panel here. Uh, everybody who's been following along over the last two weeks, Mike Adams and Terry Rolls have put together this great program, and now the the kind of the the the, the finishing touch for this is to is to bring together a panel of, of coaches and, and experts to, to discuss where the, the technology and, and information behind the scenes works with the art of coaching. How do you actually use some of this information that we've been talking about, how you interact with the person in front of you and, and, and really how you, how you mentor and how you, how you create better coaches going forward. Because I think everybody in this virtual room, that's part of their interest is, how to grow the game, how to grow coaching, how to build more golfers. And uh, I've got a daunting task trying to introduce everybody, but I'm going to give it a crack here. Uh, we've got, uh, I mean, let me just call it my list. We've got a, a, collect, a great collection of, of, of coaches who've won a variety of Golf Digest uh, teaching recognition. They've won a variety of PGA of America recognition, LPGA recognition. We've got uh, David Dedell, we've got who's a renowned club uh, club designer and club builder. Uh, Mike Adams, obviously, uh, World Golf Hall of Fame or World, World Golf Coaching Hall of Fame. Terry Rolls is in the, on the Golf Magazine uh, Top 100 list. We've got Susie Whaley, who's, who's a obviously got a big job at the PGA of America and has been on our Top 50 list in the Golf Magazine Top 100. Kevin Kirk is the reigning PGA Teacher of the Year. Rob Holding is uh, on the Golf Digest International Best Coaches list. Uh, Tina Toombs, uh, two-time LPGA uh, Teacher of the Year, just like Carol, Carol Pressinger is. Uh, Andrew Park, longtime uh, uh, coach with lots of uh, tour players under his belt. Jason Floyd, one of the top coaches in Europe. Uh, David Adele, as I said, club designer. And uh, Krista Dunton. Uh, she's uh, on our Golf Digest list as well. Uh, we're going to try to spread some of the questions out so everybody gets a chance to talk. Uh, our goal is to be as orderly as possible and, and uh, everybody's got their microphone muted. I'm going to send the questions out uh, to individuals, but if somebody else wants to weigh in, they can either message me or wave your hand and we'll do the best we can to, to, uh, to spread as much information as we can. And I, th I think I'm going to start with you, Mike Adams, uh, because uh, you and I have talked about this a lot over the last couple of weeks about what the landscape of, of coaching information was like when you started, when you started your career as a coach. And I'd like if you could just take us on a little trip from when you started uh, and, and what made you decide to try to, to, to find new information, whether it was in 1978, 1998, or now, uh, What's that journey been like for you and how would you compare what's available to the coach now compared to what was available to you when you started? Well, when I started, there really there was no video. Uh, graph check cameras had just come into vogue and where we could see sequences and look at uh, what was happening. Uh, information, I mean, information has always existed. It's just, we didn't know how to uh, analyze things. And um, there were no force plates, no, uh, uh, TrackMan, no, uh, 3D existed, but it only in the labs. And uh, basically, we had to dig it out of the dirt. And see, the instructors today are coming in on the 40th floor. They're not entering at the basement level like we all did. Uh, they, they're entering on the 40th floor. And the problem is, is they assume all the information that they know um, always existed and was always out there. But the problem is they don't recognize those of us who spent the time to um, mine it out and develop it. I mean, I hear uh, teachers scoff and say that David Ledbetter is not that great a teacher or Butch Harmon. These guys are phenomenal and in the best, to the best that's ever walked the planet. Uh, Jim McLean, uh, 
you know, Randy Smith, um, Chuck Cook, Jim Hardy. Um, I mean, we're talking about people who are giants in this industry that we all stand on their shoulders and we are there because of what they have done in the, and how they've researched and all the hours they put in and trained it. Uh, I was talking to, who was I talking to yesterday? Anyway, they were talking, maybe it was you, Matt, about teachers. I mean, McLean, Ledbetter, and myself, and Hardy probably have 80% of the top 100 teachers uh, all work for us at one point. And uh, so basically, there's a, uh, all of us have had continued to uh, help the teachers down the line. But when I started off, uh, it was good players that were doing all the teaching, helping each other out. And that's what I was, I was a player who spent a lot of time helping other people out. They liked the way I edit, so I made suggestions. Those suggestions uh, to this day um, probably did not give them a lot of help, but it gave them confidence. And uh, I wanted to find out, I had an inquisitive mind, and why I didn't want to know why people swung the club differently I, and still able to hit it. Because I was looking for uh, common denominators, like we all go in there and thinking, um, what are the great players in the past and, and uh, present doing that was all the same or similar? Um, what does uh, physics and uh, dictate that's the same? And, and going from there. And what I found out is that didn't exist. There were so many different um, models out there and so many different teachers having success teaching something. I mean, like there's no Jimmy Ballard and David Ledbetter were so far apart, it's unbelievable, but both were producing uh, major champions. So I needed to figure out why David was successful, why Jimmy Ballard was successful, uh, why Jim Hardy and why, uh, you know, in the old days, I mean, Bob Toski and Jim Flick, and then you had Ben Doyle. Ben Doyle, uh, probably one of the most knowledgeable people, knowledgeable people in the business, was creating great players as was Jim Flick, as was Bob Toski, all coming at it from different angles. So I started to study what everybody else was doing, started to study what the players were doing, and then went to the people in the know, went to orthopedic surgeons, went to some biomechanist, and had them start to test, and let's figure things out. Originally, Jim Suddy, myself, and uh, Bill Moretti, and also um, TJ Tomasi, we started off with uh, Chuck Dillman and uh, a guy by the name of Dr. Jim Sudmeyer. And, be, and we put about 100 players on 3D and force plates. And um, the answers came back that there was more than one way of swinging the golf club. And that uh, we were basically, uh, everything that we thought was correct was not correct. So we categorized them as into three categories. Mesomorph, ectomorph, or endomorph, or we call them leverage, arc, and width. So the ones who swung it in the height dimension, the ones who swung it in the width dimension, and the guys who swung it in the depth dimension, and uh, created the laws system. Well, from the law system, it was great, except for it didn't include everybody. And I would just say that's because they're an outlier. Well, I began to do more research, and uh, got, uh, Mike McTeague, had a thing called Sports Sense. So we went out on tour in the early 90s and measured everybody and got more information. And that's when I decided, okay, I need to come at this from a different uh, uh, way. So I began to assimilate the information to form what exactly what it was. I brought in a guy by the name of E.A. Tischler who was doing, so he said he's copying my information where he's doing a lot of the same things I was but he was doing it on his own. And, and he had spent time with Gideon Ariel, who was a biomechanist. Well, from there, uh, Terry Rolls and I uh, came into uh, contact. And Terry uh, has encouraged me to continue to search. And uh, it's funny because um, Terry wouldn't let that fire die out. In fact, he lit it and extinguished it, kept throwing gas on it and made me work harder uh, to know more about the golf swing. And, having people like that are on this committee to bounce things off of. I mean, uh, Rob Holding and I were talking about, we've known each other 
been friends for over 25 years. And the same thing with uh, Kevin Kirk. In fact, when uh, if I had been a better teacher, Kevin Kirk would have been a uh, top 10 money winner. Instead, he uh, became uh, one of the best teachers in the world. Debbie Doniger, I've known since she was 16 years old. Um, Tina Toombs, uh, I used to teach her when she was playing on tour and when she was winning. Somehow I got some correct information into her. But um, Jason Floyd has been a good friend from uh, who's in Spain, who uh, he and Terry worked together for a long time. Um, and he helped train him. Uh, Krista Dutton, who I've known, she, I mean, I think you, for three years, you watch about every golf lesson I gave. Um, I mean, all of them out there, David Adele, one of my very best friends, one of the smartest people in, that I've ever seen. Uh, I always tease him, I tell him he can make anything but money. And so far it's holding true. But David, uh, can, uh, I would draw something and he would invent it. Next thing you know, we had the uh, grip analyzer, the uh, thing called the Groover. The, if you don't, never seen the Groover, never swung on the Groover and don't own a Groover, as a teacher, you should own it because you can put every golf swing known to mankind. It has every hinge type, uh, every swing plane. Uh, and uh, when they come off it, uh, it's funny, their arms are automatically go where, they were where they're supposed to. Uh, plus, David uh, studied the golfing machine and is one of the best teachers in the world. I mean, phenomenal teacher, uh, both putting uh, wedges and in full swing. I mean, uh, brilliant guy. Debbie, I didn't give you your due because you were a great player, but you've turned yourself into a phenomenal teacher. I mean, you had an NCAA champion uh, on, the men, on the men's side that you developed uh, and pretty amazing. Uh, Krista won the National Teacher of the Year, uh, as did uh, Tina twice and Carol twice. Carol was a great player and has become a phenomenal teacher. Susie Whaley, very good friend, bright, uh, phenomenal. She was a great player. Uh, people don't realize it, but she was the first woman that played on the PGA Tour, played in any PGA Tour events, uh, played on the LPGA Tour. Uh, Susie's turned herself into a phenomenal teacher, and now she's leading the uh, PGA of America in the correct direction. So golf instruction is getting in better hands, but I think the younger teachers need to look back at where the information came from, thank the guys uh, who did phenomenal jobs, Ted Sheftick is a phenomenal teacher. People don't even know who he is. He's still teaching at 75 years old and still getting phenomenal resort, results and uh, making people better. Ed I. Bargain, unbelievable. Um, and I've been blessed with a lot of great assistants who uh, made me look better because uh, they did better jobs in interpreting the information. Now, Andrew Park and Terry and I have spent a lot of time together. And Andrew is probably the fastest I've ever seen learn the system. And he's come back with unbelievable information and ways of uh, teaching it. Teaches some of the best juniors in the world, some of the best tour players in the world, and uh, some of the best college players in the world. Andrew is a brilliant teacher, brilliant guy, and a great, uh, great person. Kevin Kirk, I said, was a phenomenal player, but probably one of the five best teachers in the world. And my good friend, Terry Rolls, I don't think there's a better teacher in the world than Terry. Terry is brilliant. He's uh, inquisitive, always uh, searching for the truth, and nobody works harder at their craft than Terry. Um, I don't know if I've gone through everybody. Who did I miss? I wish I would have asked that because I was trying. I missed Debbie when I did the intro. Sorry, Debbie. <laughs> well, uh, you know, it's funny and. Um, Good friend of mine who worked, who was an, also worked with us, was, uh, and she asked me a, a question. She says, "When am I going to know that I become a good teacher?" And I don't think I can say it on the air, but Kelly Stenzel asked her what the what the response was, and and she started laughing and then became a great teacher. So um, let's go ahead, continue on, Terry. Well, yeah, let me, I have, I have a good one for you, Terry. You and I have been texting back and forth about this for the last couple of weeks. And uh, um, it, it, it's this uh, Library of Congress metaphor that we've been serving back and forth like a tennis ball. Uh, and I think in the, in the world of golf instruction, there's, there's just an almost unlimited amount of information out there. Good information, mediocre information, bad information. It's lots of technical information. There's all kinds of data. There's uh, force data that there's, I mean, you name it, there's video, 
Uh, there's archival images that, that some television commentators like to point at as, as the way forward. Um, the question for every coach, and I think for everybody who plays the game, is how do you sort that information? Uh, if you're a coach, how do you sort it? How do you sort it for yourself? How do you sort it for your students? Well, to give context, I'll kind of answer the question that you asked Mike very, very briefly and say that, you know, in, in my career, um, you know, we've come from the video age to, you know, launch monitors, motion capture and um, force plate data. And that's a ton of new information that's come into the industry. And, you know, we've had probably more than 10 years of a technological age. Um, you know, there's all these little moments of uh, kind of noise bubbling up saying, you know, I've solved it. This is the answer. Um, you know, the technology companies themselves provide averages. And so I think, you know, what we've been over this week during the event is to say, you know, it's almost like there's no need for more information, but the phase we're in right now is to understand the information and to loop back and say, you know, take our hat off to what Mike said and say, you know, there are no outliers, you know, there's, there's terrifically successful players who show all sorts of different patterns. And that was visible in a video uh, in an older generation, but now it's visible on a force plate, it's visible on a motion capture system, it's visible on a, on a launch monitor. And so I think the, um, you know, the, the, the people that grasp onto a piece of that information and run with it are going to find it's a, it's a dead end eventually. And I think, you know, the combination of my determination to make sense of the, the technology and uh, along with Mike's determination to, to make sense of the technology and everybody else in this room has um, led to, you know, the project that we're working on is, is, a, is a system that, you know, hopefully is, is increasing people's understanding of the, the vast amount of information that is out there. So I think it's, it's a pretty cool time to, to be using technology because I think, you know, the, the hardest work is, is, is almost done, I would say, and there's, obviously we're gonna continue to learn, that's what we do, but it's a time when we can actually start making sense of all the different styles of players in, in every dimension now. Gary, um, Rob Holding first came to me about 26 years ago for a golf lesson. And uh, Rob is one of the best teachers in the world. And what Rob has always been able to do is ask phenomenal questions. And every time I spent, every time, I spent time with Rob, I would come back and have to research more answers. And he's continued to do that uh, the last 26 years. And that's what's made him a phenomenal teacher. And I think everybody in this room has worked really hard at their craft of becoming great teachers. All right, I've got a good question for you, Debbie. Uh, if you think back, uh, this is for Debbie Doniger. If you, if you think back, uh, what, what advice would today Debbie Doniger give to your, to your beginner teacher self when you were your first year as a, as a coach? Uh, that's a good question because I've thought about my career path and I think it's one that the generations before me actually followed. And for me personally, it's not necessarily about seminars and out of books and being tested. My education and being the best that you can be has to be tailored to who you are. So as Mike alluded to, you know, Jim McLean was my teacher my whole life. And yes, we used video cameras in the 80s. Mike knows that. He pulled out the thing, wrote notes on the back. We were drawing on the screens. He did have technology to determine face and path. And so we were way ahead of the game as certain teachers were of that genre. I think Mike would agree with that completely. And then after I stopped playing for a living and started working for Jim, I think the, to bridge the gap with Mike and the people on this panel and the people that Mike has chosen to do these seminars makes complete sense. So it takes experience, it takes time, it takes being with the right people, it takes asking questions. And so once I broke away a little bit from McLean and his system of being in corridors and what your body and club can do and you can effectively play really well, well then Mike, comes in back into my life years ago. And it's like, well, this is why the strong grip works. And this is why these swings work. And then you bring um, the physiological side into it. So you bring Ben into it, and then you start to marry all of that together. But that takes 
25 plus years for me at least. It's not a quick fix and it's not a quick read and it's not a quick seminar. And I think I agree with Mike. If I was going to do a seminar, which I would love to do, it would be of people like this. It would be voracious learners. It would be people that have been in the business forever because it's, um, it, it takes a long time to gather the information, to be able to disseminate it to your student in a very simple way. And so for me, it's, it's the way I've done it. And then like Mike said, when I go visit Chuck Cook before COVID, I mean, here's a man that's 30 years on me that paved the way or Randy Smith. And they're still learning about the swing and still trying to get it right and still trying to make it better. And we're working more, I think, as an industry, or especially this group, towards an individual way to think about the golf swing. And that pictures on the wall and sequencing of the swing and the professionals, you know, that doesn't quite take into account the timing and the sequencing. And then you as the individual, the student in front of you, it just doesn't, I think we're moving in that way. But again, it takes tons of time, I think. Mm -hmm. Rob Holding, I'll ask you the same question. You can uh, go back in uh, in a time capsule and talk to your uh, your beginner coach self. What kinds of things? What kind of advice are you giving your beginner coach self, either from a coaching standpoint or even from a business standpoint? Wow, uh, great question. Um, if I had to start all over again, I would have learned more about anatomy and biomechanics uh, as a as a an educational starting point rather than, uh, you know, wandering around for years, reading different books and different theories and everybody seems to contradict that one person contradicts the next person. And it's very hard finding your way as a young teacher. I came into golf instruction with a 17 year background in executive management in the chain restaurant industry. So I was well prepared with the people skills and I was well prepared on the management side and I had a pretty good idea how to run businesses. But I didn't have the, I thought my job as a teacher was to teach. And I would, I, I've said this to many people, I would suggest strongly if you're a young teacher starting out, accidentally leave your, your phone these days or your video camera running and then go home at night and watch what you did. It's pathetic sometimes. You don't realize how much you over teach. And uh, uh, that's probably because you don't really have a plan. And I, I think that's the great thing about what Mike and Terry and EA and other great teachers have done here with this this program is that they've it's you know it's not the easiest thing in the world to understand but it is critical that you understand it if you want to have be a really successful teacher you cannot go wrong with this i, I just believe you know you it will take you some time to learn it and 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 i think that mike and terry and ea and all the other people who are involved in this will say you know what we're, we're still getting more and more out of this there's more layers being developed all the time and uh, there is no magic bullet. It, one thing teachers and students uh, have in common is they all want information made easy. And, and, and folks, there's, <laughs> there's so many degrees of freedom in a golf swing and there's so many different personalities and people out there. It's never going to be that easy, right? But this does make it a lot easier. Uh, 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 anyway, I hope that answers your question from a, a business standpoint. I've been, I, right out of the gate, I was pretty successful and I think that was largely because I had good people skills. I, I, I listened to people. Uh, I, I showed care and concern. Uh, I would research. I would think about their lesson afterwards. The next time they came, I was somewhat prepared to try something. Uh, not always successful. Uh, but yeah, I think, I think ask, ask a lot of questions. Don't, don't have to be a teller. Ask a lot of questions of the people. Like, how does this feel? How do you feel? What are your real goals? A lot of people just tell you, look, I don't want to be on the tour. I just want to get four strokes better. And okay, you know, that, that's, that's, that's doable. And what's the least invasive way to do it? Anyway, I Perfect. hope that answers your question. It does. Uh, Susie Whaley, I've got one for you. This is kind of a, 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 a two-tiered question because I think it's related to what we're experiencing with, you know, with COVID and, and being home and or, or being uh, separated from people. Uh, and number two, it's more of a broader question about uh, the industry in, in general. Uh, what kind of skills do you think coaches are going to have to have or develop going forward uh, to, to connect with students, uh, whether that means doing it virtually like this 
or just uh, in inventive ways to try to bring more people into the game. Yeah, thanks. And I'm thrilled to be a part of this. I couldn't agree more with the first two answers. But I think as we move forward in an environment that obviously is far more virtual, um, we all hope to get back to the lesson T. But what I'm telling young professionals is don't ignore this side now as an opportunity, as a business opportunity, as Rob said, right? So those that have already engaged in this platform were ahead of the curve uh, and good for them. There's apps out there that can help every teacher uh, communicate with a client or their customer or their student on a daily basis if they so choose in a private space or, or in a group platform in a training space where you're sending out information. Um, you can charge for that. You can choose not to charge for that. But I would tell you that, you know, this, I don't see us returning uh, to only on T instruction. I think what's going to be most difficult is those of us that pretty much all of us that are on this um, webinar have spent so much time watching amazing people perform their craft. Uh, and and I, I've watched local great coaches right here in, in Palm Beach uh, perform their craft as well as, as top teachers from around the world. Um, took the time to go ahead and do that and, and fly there. I think what's really cool now is the opportunity perhaps for some top teachers to have a virtual space like Mike and Terry have done for the rest of the world or instead of having to hop on a plane, I actually get to watch them teach. Um, that can only be influential and amazing for young coaches. And where Mike said they're starting on the 40th floor, if I were to have a concern about that, it would be probably just because of the way I did it, which oftentimes is unfair. But I would tell you that, you know, I did it through experience. I, I, I didn't understand physics when I first started teaching. I was trained by Jim Flick and Bob Toski and, and Martin Hall and many others I had the opportunity to work with. Um, but I just saw what didn't work, what did work, trial and error, um, at the expense of my student, mostly when I started, um, but also in my learning environment. So um, but I would never trade that. When you asked Debbie, you know, what would she change? I don't know that I would change that. Uh, because it made me much more inquisitive. It made me uh, seek out people who knew more than I did. It made me, uh, you know, unbelievable reader of material. Um, did I understand it all? Because to your point, they were always conflicting. Uh, but that confliction was what I was having on a lesson tee. And it made you dive in and think, well, maybe there is some, some thought to John Jacobs. Maybe there is a different way to do this. Maybe there is a different way to tra train um, front post, center post, rear post. Uh, certainly, I didn't call it that at the time, um, but you just figured it out. So it's an unbelievable opportunity uh, in a time that you have. We all have to remain respectful for the fact that people are really ill uh, and really sick. Um, but you can't ignore the business side of this and the fact that we are going to come on the other side of this. And I think golf has an enormous opportunity to showcase the health and wellness of the game and the best teachers in the world of the game. And to do that, we have to be ready and we have to be able to deliver systems that people can see and, and be a part of online as well as on the T. Excellent. Uh, Kevin, Kevin Kirk, and then uh, Terry after um, uh, you're, you're working with some elite players and this is an unprecedented time. You know, uh, uh, your, your interaction has got to be different because of the restrictions and travel. Uh, and it's got to be different because really there's no such thing as an off season for a tour player. So I'll start with you, Kevin. Uh, how have you been interacting and coaching your elite players now in this kind of strange time? Thanks, Matt. I think, uh, um, you know, it's really just something no, none of us had ever seen. And so uh, for the for the touring professionals at this point, they've got they, they their time is over the course of the year, they get virtually no time off. So a lot of the guys have t taken this as actually, you know, and you've always in the, you know, you've always kind of got that opportunity in the face of crisis that you can kind of seek out. And these guys have, have all taken probably all the guys I'm involved with have taken this time as an off as an off season and try to figure out what they can upskill. It's just in, in their nature to to kaizen and keep getting better. So so as they as they um have kind of moved into this to this time period. A lot of them have started taking times or trying to, you know, they've all got a, they've all got projects up on the board. It could be fitness. It could be trying to prove one segment of their game. Uh, and and uh, the, the tour's given us a start date on uh, uh, June 8th. We'll see if it holds, but uh, 
at least right now that gives the guys an, an idea of how to start building their preparation towards that start date. And uh, I'm fortunate that uh, the guys that I coach, most of them actually live here in, in the area. So it's actually been great. Uh, the guys are starting to kind of get together and play a little bit uh, once or twice a week, which is fun. Uh, each one of them have their own uh, things that they're working on, their own preparation that they're going through. Uh, some, of, some of the guys are preparing a lot more, uh, spending a lot more time at the golf course. Other guys are trying to get their, you know, get other, other things sorted out. But everybody is is working towards this restart with the idea that once it does restart, it's going to be fast moving till through the end of the year. It's going to be a lot on. And uh, so there won't be any time to take up anything else on except try to focus on performance. How about you, Terry? I know you've seen a couple of players in, in Arizona, but it, how you had to use technology uh, to you know, shoot lessons back and forth, texting, is, is that it? has that changed the way you interact with players? Yeah, I know uh, a lot of people have been doing uh, online lessons. Um, I think myself and Mike also, we also get a lot of text, uh, you know, swings. But, you know, this has actually got me into the 21st century. I've been doing, you know, FaceTime lessons, which I've come to terms with and, and done some of that stuff. But as you say, I've been, um, I've been able to get out and teach a couple of the pros, um, you know, on the tee here, obviously with uh, respectable social distancing. Um, I, I think, you know, almost universally, uh, you know, everybody I work with finds this to be an opportunity is, you know, one of them has an injury that basically would have needed four weeks to, to heal. You know, another was, um, we just starting out. So we, we needed to, to get on the same page. That was a really good opportunity to clear any of the misconceptions early. So, you know, like Kevin said, it's a really long, um, off season. And, you know, I think, you know, professional talking to a player that are there. So what did, did the players in the old days get as injured as they do now? And he says, well, not really, because they they had a lot more time off. Right. They didn't have as many tournaments. It wasn't as in-depth as it is now. So I think, you know, this is really an opportunity for everybody I work with to, you know, spend time with their family, you know, not travel for weeks on end, which is really unusual. I mean, the, the real off season is really very short normally. Um, you know, a couple of guys are, are making some changes that, that would require a little bit of time prior to going back into competition, which obviously they got more than enough time to get ready for that now. So I think it's, um, uh, I think it's a, you know, opportunity is actually the way to look at it for a lot of these guys to get healthy, clarify their goals, you know, streamline the procedures that they're using to achieve those goals. So I think, you know, the time has given, given everybody some clarity about kind of the procedures and things that they're going to, to work on it's going to be interesting to see who you know i think we might be surprised who comes out of the break with some incredible performances because they've had some you know some health and and some time to work on some good stuff so it, it's going to be interesting who you know if somebody who's who goes about their work really intelligently is going to get rewarded i would say for this time also so. i think pl players who are who can deal with uh, adversity? Uh, you know, everyone can tick off the players that if the weather gets a little bad or the schedule changes, they 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 lose the plot. The, the players that can deal with changes in schedule, the, the, I think those are the ones that are going to flourish. Um, uh, Tina, I wanted to ask this uh, question for you. Uh, Randy Smith is one of my dearest friends in golf, and and I, I've had a lot of great conversations with him in the twenty years that I've been at Golf Digest, and and. He told me something a couple of years ago that resonated with me because I have little kids myself. I have three daughters, 11 and under. And he said that regardless of how he felt about technology, um, if he didn't figure out ways to interact with junior players through screens, uh, you know, the way that the way they live, he was going to struggle to connect with those junior players. And and I wanted to, to, to ask you about that uh, in terms of how you interact with junior players now compared to how you might have 10 years ago? Have you, have you had to adapt because of the way juniors are learning and processing information? Do you do, you do it the same way that you've always done it? What's, what's your approach with junior players? Oh, hi, Matt. Uh, thank you for having me on today. Um, I think that there's a, a different approach with each junior player. I think uh, we, you know, we have to also um, understand the parent when we have the junior player. Um, but I think, um, 
what I like to do is also, uh, I always screen my junior players. So if I screen my player, um, then I know where to start. So I don't, there's no guesswork. And just like Mike uh, has always said is if you screen, then you know where to start. So then the parent also understands that and where the student needs to be. The Game Forge system I use, and I like that because that also gives us some uh, a platform to start with so the student and the parent knows where the student is um, in their game. And so with the juniors, there's a lot of competitive parents. Um, and I try to take the student with the parent and put them on the same, same platform so that the, the parent doesn't put pressure with the juniors. And I try and keep juniors as juniors. I raised two daughters myself and I found that there was a lot of pressure for kids to be adults way too soon. So I try to keep it as fun as I can and keep the kids just playing the game to enjoy it for a lifetime so that they do play for a lifetime and not too much pressure so that they quit before they're 15. But um, I really uh, try and keep it as fun as I can and keep the parent uh, to not put too much pressure on the child. I've seen too many kids quit the game. So I, I do try and separate it that way. So those are the three pillars I go at is keep it fun, make sure I screen and try and keep the parents um, to not put too much pressure on the, on the juniors to play at a professional level when they're kids. <laughs> Andrew Park, you've grown a lot of uh, players up through the junior ranks to, into the professional game. How do you uh, how do you compare the way you deal with 15 year olds in 2020 to how you might have 10 years ago? Um, you know, nowadays it's all different uh, because back in the old days, we used to use video camera and that was about all we had. And and then uh, today we've got all the different measurements you know you're going from launch monitors to um, 3d etc and um, so measurement because i had a student at one time he came in and he said to me um i've got uh, i want to let you know that measurement is everything about golf and i looked at him and i asked him what do you mean by that he says if i don't film somebody um if, if the pro doesn't film anybody, if the, he doesn't use any data uh, recordings like uh, launch monitors, 3D, etc., he said he'd probably never go back to that, uh, to that instructor. And I found that very interesting because I think today, now we can dissect and we can actually uh, get right down to the nitty gritty or the parts that we have to work on in the game. So whether it's uh, using Game Forge or is it measuring the student through data or through film, film just sort of confirms it. And so teaching today has become more specific, whereas in the older days, I think it was just a little bit more uh, guesswork or you, you know, it was sort of, well, we hope we hit the home run here. And um, I remember uh, when we got certified at Leadbetters, uh, one of the books we had to read was uh, Mike Adams's book, uh, The Golf Laws. And that taught us, uh, you know, about different players and, and their, um, uh, their way, you know, like broader shoulders and, and skinny people. They're all going to swing differently. And so now uh, in the olden days, everybody was sort of focused on picking a, a swing, say when Tiger came out or even before that it was um, Faldo, everybody tried to swing that way. And so then every tour player that came in would say, hey, you know, I want to get my swing looking like Tiger. And then juniors, juniors just wanted to go with the, with the flow. I mean, they, everybody wanted to look Tiger. They all got these finishes looking like Tiger. And so anyway, when I had one tour player came in and uh, this player said to me, you know, do I have to tuck my arm in? And I said, no, you don't have to. And I said, why is that? And he said, oh, thank you. That's, you know, I'm so glad to hear that because I have a problem tucking my arm in and all teachers are telling me to tuck my arm in because everybody thought that was the norm back in the day. So the student said, you know, can you show me swings that, you know, if the elbow can fly out. So I, I pulled up uh, Craig Stadler, I pulled up um, 
Bruce Lisky. And I said, there you go. And then lo and behold, this, this girl gets on the LPJ within the, within about six months, just because of, of that. So back in those days, we had no way of, you know, and realizing what a, how a person's going to swing. Whereas today, uh, the people, uh, we can go in and measure these kids, uh, the top juniors. We can actually find out which way, how they're going to swing. And then you give them a blueprint and say, this is your body. This is the way it's going to happen. And so it's like, you know, if you go to a doctor, uh, they always write down the things that are wrong. Um, you know, and then, so when you go to the doctor, the next time they'll have everything, you know, report so that you, they keep an eye. So it's the same thing with golf. You've got to have a, when a person comes in, measure them and have a record of it. So that when you go, when that person comes back in, that record, uh, you can look at it and you go, oh yeah, yes, this person's a front post or this person's a, under co a side cover or you know, a side under. And then you know exactly what, how they swing and how they're supposed to. So then you can maintain, because before it was a hit and miss, I believe, uh, where you, you may have taught them a Adam Scott swing and it didn't match. And so then today you get more of the blueprint. And so now you can go, okay, you fall under the Tiger category or you fall under the uh, Gary Woodland category because of the way you move. So now that student has a good picture and then they go. So it applies to both the pros and the, the top, you know, any junior should that should for that matter. And then the last thing, um, today we're seeing people increase their club air speed tremendously versus the old day. We didn't have much to measure with. That's before the launch monitors. So no one get got longer. Now I've seen uh people get much longer. Uh, I was in um, uh, China with Mike and Terry, and we saw this one guy, he was probably mid fifties. He had an, a club air speed of about 86 miles an hour. And within 10 minutes, he was swinging at 106. So there's a 20 mile an hour difference. So that's a remarkable change. So the system that I'm seeing now is very valuable because you're putting, you've got golf swings and then we've got data. And then, so when students come in, they know exactly what they need to do. And you can go back and look at the records, see how they're playing, you know, using Game Forge, and you can see where they're falling apart. So data, I think is everything and measurement. Jason, I know you have a junior academy. I'll, uh, I'll ask you the same question. And also I'll add to it. There's a question uh, from Rob Stock in the, in the crowd uh, who wants to know, uh, Mike and Terry said to keep things more vanilla until growth plates set. What screens do you do to, to coach a, an eight to 10 year old uh, in, term, in terms of, I mean, do, you, do you keep it more basic for younger kids before, before their bodies are done developing or, or, or how do you approach screening for, for, for younger players? First, um, Matt. Yep. What I meant was in vanilla. Uh, I, I test everybody posts first mm -hmm. as a kid, and if they are front, they then they're going to be front. If they are center, they're going to be center. If they're rear, they're going to be rear. So I test the post and utilize that wingspan uh, and forearm length. Those things are the things that change. Uh, grip changes with age as they get older. They tend to move, start to move more on top, but. Uh, Basically, um, post is the one is the one screen I use on every single one, no matter what age. Okay. Jason, uh, yeah, two two part question. One, how do you screen younger players? And then the second part is, how how is it? How have you changed the way you relate to junior players? Uh, say in the last ten years. Hmm. Good couple of questions. Um, yeah. So like Mike was saying, you know we. Um, obviously have quite an age range uh, of our full-time junior players, but sort of the youngest category will be from 10 to, to 14. Um, and then we have uh, 14, 16 year olds as full-timers and 16 to 18. And obviously then we um, forward them on uh, to you guys, uh, obviously over in the States, 
to, to college scholarships there. Um, but certainly with regards to, to screening, uh, we were doing it on a pretty consistent basis, as we're saying, you know, we're, we're seeing obviously some massive uh, growth changes for some of these kids. Um, I'm kind of, I guess I'm touching six foot, but I feel like a dwarf these days. Some of these kids are coming in already at like six foot three and six foot four um, with uh, unbelievable club head speeds. Um, so, you know, I think for us, I think it's, it's great what Terry and, and Mike uh, are doing. Um, I think probably the biggest thing and the most special thing I think we have going on with this is the education level uh, in the world. Um, so for everybody now to be a little bit more understanding of this language is, is highly important. You know, obviously, we have a lot of elite players that are playing in national teams uh, across Europe. Um, so obviously, they're going to be exposed to other coaches. So I think it's very, very important that whether they go back to their home golf club in Germany or Switzerland or wherever they're from, or whether they're seeing a national team coach, that these national coaches as well are understanding you know, some of the, the amazing work that Mike and Terry have, uh, you know, been producing the, these past years with really how to, how to map a player, how to find their DNA, how to test, you know, you're, you're not, you're not guessing, you're measuring. Um, and then hopefully we're educating and ultimately empowering the player. Um, the player will understand their DNA. They understand their swing. You know, I think some of the guys are saying that we've very much come from a video age, through the 2000s, you know, the effect of Tiger Woods and, and, and video, Tiger Woods' is swing on, on video, you know, for a, a, a massive period of time. And even now, people love to have that look. So to be, you know, perfectly on plane and the club looking in, in the right position, at the top of the backswing, all this kind of stuff, um, that might be great for a certain amount of people. As we know, if, if you're a side on gripper, center poster, and, and your wingspan matches your height, but what about the rest of the world? Um, so I think it's, it's, it's an amazing job that, that, that Terry and Mike uh, do. Obviously, I've known Terry for 20 years. I know he's a very uh, determined character, and I've known now Mike for, uh, for, for two, just over two years. And uh, he's very tenacious as well. So there, there's no stopping those two, um, which I think is really going to help our, our profession. Ultimately, that filters down into, as I said, you know, um, the world of junior players, we all have a responsibility. Whilst obviously as coaches, we really like to see our players, um, you know, perform well in, in college. And, uh, you know, we, we're we very proud that we have one of our kids called Ty Christensen has just been signed up by Oklahoma State. Uh, so he'll go there in a year and a half's time. So we're all very proud of that fact that, you know, we're producing champions and the rest of it, but it's the other side of it. I think we need to um, you know, protect and preserve our game. I think Tina was alluding to how we educate parents. That's massive. Um, obviously, I think parents, uh, yeah, they need a huge education package. Sometimes the amount of times they derail their kids and get in the way um, of, you know, I think being too pushy and, and maybe not understanding the process. So again, I think this comes back to what we're talking about. A really good level of education with a fantastic system. Uh, Tina was saying again, you know, really getting the, the 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 parent very much parallel to the track to really understand the journey ahead. So, you know, obviously things as well like Game Forge to understand the the, the scoring complexity of this game, and, and there's so many skills within the game, so many skills within the skills to learn. Um, so yeah, I think uh, I hope I've answered the questions. A bit of a long-winded answer, but um, yeah, no, I hope I hope this sort of stuff continues that we all as coaches get on a, on a better level so that we can help young players understand what they need to do, educate parents, grow the game. And then within that, yes, of course, we'll get successes along the way. So speaking of uh, owner's manuals, this is, this is another subject that probably should come with an owner's manual, but it doesn't. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna start with you, Krista. Um, how, how do you think uh, social media and golf instruction work together? Do they? Uh, do they not? Uh, how do how do you use social media, uh, and what do you think some of the pitfalls are of, for the average student trying to follow along with what's going on in golf instruction, either for the tour or for their own game through social media? Um, you know, I'm going to say I think it can do more harm than good. I mean, it certainly has benefits. I just don't think on the student side, I don't think they have any concept of what applies to them and what doesn't. 
I mean, there's so much, like we alluded to earlier, so much vast information out there. So on a marketing and promotional side, you know, sure, it's entertainment. People like to tune in. I think it can be used better and smarter and more helpful for the student than it's being done now. Um, I just think if you don't know to decipher what applies to you, you just, you just don't know. Same, you know, and in the education, everyone in this room, I mean, I first met Mike 26 years ago. He presented a PGA uh, seminar on the laws. I thought, that's just brilliant. I have to learn more. And he said, well, come watch me teach. So the next three winters, I claimed unemployment from my job in New Jersey and slept on my cousin's couch in Jupiter and sat on his teeth filling notebooks and notebooks and met, you know, Kelly Stenzel and uh, Sarge. I mean, just list goes on of the people that work for Mike. But I watched him interact with the people and watched him giving his information. And he offered me a job. And I said, well, when I don't want to work for you, then I can't watch you teach, you know, that I'm teaching. So I, I turned it down just so I could be around him and watch all, everything that he did. But what I, what I learned from that was not only information that we can get from the webinars, but how he worked with people, how he taught a 32 handicap with the same passion and the same knowledge base as he did a tour player. Didn't treat him any differently, gave them the same, the same passion and same courtesy. And that was huge. And I also got to see how he ran his golf schools, how, you know, PJ National was thriving during those times. I mean, it was a factory to say the least. And as a young teacher, I got to see how they set up for clinics, how they ran golf schools, how they did individual lessons, what the flow of the day looked like, how the students and the staff were interacting. I mean, the club fitting component, the mental component, the physical component, there was just so much there. So, um, I guess for me, you know, with the whole social media, it's so much self-promotion. Um, I don't like how golf pros treat each other out there in the world of Facebook. Mike Adams and Jim Hardy would probably be my two biggest mentors. And from everything that they've taught me, both tailoring it to the individual and individual ball flight, but how they teach, how they handle their students and how they handle all their golf pros. I've never heard either of those gentlemen put another pro down and they never would. And I think it's their caring, and I'm choked up here, and <laughs> you know, it's a mouth that they care as human beings. I mean, I know everyone in this panel gets a text from Mike on Christmas, Easter, you know, Groundhog Day, I think, just checking in, seeing how you're doing. And, you know, that's the stuff I think you don't see on the social media side and, um, and the learning, the learning base of it. And, and my foot, my leg will waggle giving a lesson sometime and I have to chuckle because that's, you know, if you sat and watched Mike teach, you see that leg start to shake, you know, so there's just little mannerisms, you know, that I've taken from him, taken from Jim, watching him teach countless hours. And I, it just, it goes back to the individual. It goes back to understanding their ball flight. Um, I will say the last thing I'll say is, you know, I, I feel fortunate with both Mike and Jim's knowledge because they both put in the categories and they make as a teacher, you understand what fits and what box. And then that player's in front of you, you know, between the screens, obviously, Jim's ball flight, pluses and minuses. So I've been able to kind of take pluses and minuses of Hardy's information and then even put it into the screens. Well, is an under, is that more of a minus or is a plus? Is an on top more of a plus? Is that gonna steep an impact? Is that gonna shallow it and be able to apply ball flight to the screens and really customize it to the individual. So, you know, in social media, I, I've seen great teachers out there and social media makes students worse. I can say I've never sat watching Mike teach in, in Hardy and within 10 seconds that student's better, you know? So I don't know if, if there's a need for it, I guess. We're in that world. I need to do more of it, I know, to kind of grow my own business, uh, but I, I'd like to see us take it in a in a more positive uh, positive manner and, and and more beneficial. Well, I tell you, we can't get away from Mike Adams on social media. That guy is just <laughs> tweeting every other minute. He's on Facebook every other minute. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I want to ask uh, David Adele and Mike, uh, both of you guys, uh, David especially, and, and I'm going to leave this question as broad as possible because I'm curious to see where you take it. Um, how do you merge art with science? Ooh. That's a tough one. I mean, they're kind of the same thing, I think. You know, I don't think there's a scientist that isn't artful. 
you know, you have to have that artistic mind to be able to see spatially into um, whatever, you know, Einstein was an artist, even though he was a scientist. Um, you know, I, I think when I look at myself and I look at Mike, I, Mike is an artist, um, one of the greatest I've ever been around. He has the ability in his mind to to see something and formulate. I think he sees everything before he actually opens his mouth, which is a very difficult skill set. Um, I I can make something from scratch out of metal without ever drawing, making a drawing. So I you know I can I I think a lot of the great teachers that I've been around have that skill set. They have this artistic mind. You know I I was fortunate to spend quite a bit of time with Bryson, um, and you know, everybody thinks he's just mechanical and he's a machine, but he's actually an artist. Um, and, and you know, he's, he's visually working in his mind. He can visualize everything before he's actually trying to, to do it. And he just needs science to back it up. Um, so, um, you know, I find myself uh, uh, very mechanical in my mind, very artistic, but I, I can build things in my head before I actually do it. And I can see it and I can visualize, I, I, I never stop. And I think that's Mike's, uh, his mind never stops moving. He, he thinks on multiple levels and he visualizes everything he's doing. And I, I may be wrong, Mike, but I don't think I am. I, I, I know you, and I think Terry thinks the same way too. And I think EA and, and I think, you know, um, I, I think that's, if, if I could say the, the thing that I'm um, grateful for with this is that Mike, I think artists, I don't care if you were back in the day with the, the, the impressionists or scientists, we all end up at the same table, right? Um, we find each other. We find commonalities, we find ways to argue, we find ways to compromise. And I think what, what Mike has done is he's put a, a table together of artists and scientists to where we all are talking an artistic scientific language that, that is very unique. I think you know, the, the greatest network in golf is, in my opinion, is, is Mike's. Um, because we all coalesce around each other and we like each other and we appreciate each other and we don't kick sand in each other's faces. And, and I see that's what's going on out there in the, in the, in the network is all these people, they think they're scientists, they think they're artists, but what they really are, and Mike and I have talked about it, is they're repackagers. And there's a big, you know, you can't repackage something and, you know, make it yourself, make it your own. You know, I can go buy Skittles and put them in with another bag and call them Adele's, but they're really Skittles. Um, and, and so what Mike and Terry and EA and, you know, Jim Hardy and Ledbetter and everybody that's been out there, Randy Henry, one of my mentors, Ben Doyle, they were never repackagers. They, they, ben always gave credit to Homer, you know. Um, Mike always gives credit to who he's learned from. I've always tried to do the same thing. And I think we all that, that are in this network know that we, we, we can't repackage what Mike's doing. We're just part of that artistic scientific base of what Sasha and everybody's validated, you know, Scott Lynn and everybody. So, you know, what we have and everybody that's watching this is part of a phenomenal network of knowledge and we share it. And, and one of the things I've learned from Mike is to share this knowledge um, that I have, and, and I teach people to teach, you know, I teach people to putter fit, how to club fit, and I don't hold anything back, and Mike's never held anything back, Terry doesn't hold anything back, because they're basically, they're ahead of everybody, right, so, um, so they don't have any worries about giving it up, and that'll be the legacy of artists, is to leave something behind, and scientists to leave their craft behind, because, you know, like you said, Everybody's starting on the 40th floor. You know, there's people that have that didn't repackage anything. They 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 integrate. And I think that's what Mike is the great integrator.
um, the greatest of all time. Mike, how, how, about, you, how about you? There's there's a lot of science, obviously, in, in golf instruction, and it's physics, it's math, but the soft skills are art. How do you merge the art with the science? Uh -huh. um, I was very fortunate. My father uh, was the second person that Homer, Keller brought, Homer, Homer Kelly brought the uh, golfing machine to. So uh, I had an early age, I had an indoctrination to the golfing machine. And which had a lot of good things and had some things that weren't so good. But uh, then I got to spend a lot of time with some orthopedic surgeons and they helped me uh, understand what I needed to understand about things um, as far as the science of it. Um, I mean, ball flight monitors and stuff. I mean, th there was this uh, golf tech and sport tech were the original uh, ball flight monitors They and club data. We used those way back in the 80s. Uh, we we're using video cameras and uh, like uh, I had force plates in the 80s. Um, technology has allowed me to be an artist because what it does is it gives me the answers so that I can go ahead and sculpt the student into being the player that they have the potential to be. So technology uh, and the science of it has allowed me to become an artist. Um, David Adele, uh, best putter instructor, instructor I ever saw. Also a pretty phenomenal golf instructor. He was the worst wedge player that I'd ever seen until we designed some new wedges. He, could, he had the, uh, the chunk, the blade, uh, the double hit and the uh, skull all down to a, to a fine art. But uh, once he had the right wedge, all of a sudden he didn't have those shots. But um, he is an innovator. Terry Rolls is an innovator. Um, everybody I try to spend time with are innovators. Everybody on this panel is an innovator. And Rob Holding asks brilliant questions. Uh, Kevin Kirk is an innovator. You give them information and they take it to a different uh, level. Carol Preisinger, she, every time I'm around her, I get something new. She's unbelievable, we're creative, uh, trying to create things. They're all artists. Uh, Susie Whaley, um, Tina Toombs, uh, Debbie Doniger, um, Andrew Park. I mean, Terry and I were talking about it. Uh, we taught him the system. He ran with it, and pretty soon he's sending us drills that we've never seen before, and we're utilizing them. Uh, a good friend of ours, Tim Wood, down in, uh, in Australia can not only uh, – clog toilets, but he can flat out teach and play. Um, then we've, uh, you know, everybody in this in this panel, Jason Floyd, uh, one of the quickest I've ever seen at picking things up. Uh, he and I were uh, doing a uh, seminar with Smart to Move, and we had 15 golf professionals, and the least club head speed we increased and uh, fixed their path and stuff was like eight miles an hour, and we had them as high as 20 miles an hour. Isn't that true, Jason? So, you know, he's a gifted, talented teacher. Um, the art is easy. The science, what I've developed from the science is uh, Terry Rolls uh, is all of a sudden he says, we need to make sure what we say is exactly correct. Can't jump to some conclusion until we can prove it. And I become better at that because of Terry Roll. Um, Terry Rolls is a brilliant guy. You talk about a science and an artist, He's one of the best I've ever seen. Um, the teachers from before, the Ledbetter, the Jim Hardys, Jim McLean, Chuck Cook, uh, the uh, Randy Smiths, the Hank Haney, uh, Ted Sheftix, um, unbelievable uh, smart people, Butch Harmon. Butch Harmon is one of the most creative and artistic people I've ever seen in a golf lesson. Uh, we, I, I've accused him of having a pocket full of magic dust that he sprinkles on them and they immediately go out and win. Uh, he's got the uh, Midas touch. But as far as knowledge, as good as anybody. He knows when, what to say and when to say it. Uh, and um, we've got some young teachers coming up but who are going to be, who are becoming artists. And uh, right now, everybody has become more scientists. We need to get back to being more artists. That's a, that's a great segue into the next question I had, which is for Carol. Um, we've been talking a lot about some of the different skills that 
coaches have in this room. And what I wanted to learn from you is what you think the, the most challenging skill to develop as a coach was and which skill might be the most uh, underrated skill a coach can develop? Wow. Um, I was a product of the LPGA education growing up when I uh, was learning how to teach other than watching my father. And the, the application, learning the physics of ball flight was certainly important, but the element of communicating to your student um, is just as important. And I think that they're, you know, underrated. I think there might be a lot of coaches out there that have that art of truly coaching and taking their student out to the course and navigating their journey and becoming connected and being able to communicate and help the student understand what they want to do and they can perform. I think that's very underrated. Um, I know that as I was going through the LPGA program, a lot of people, a lot of people, frankly, would call the over um, importance of communicating to the student and the student centered model, a lot of fluff, but it's not, it's not, that's, that is the art. Um, I think that a lot of, as everybody has said, a lot of teachers today have a ton of technology at their fingertips, but if you have all of this data and all of this information that we are swimming in and you cannot coach them, you cannot take that information and help the student understand what they want to do, then you don't, you, you're missing the art of what we're doing. And, and as everybody said, and Mike just said, we all have the experience of having the knowledge and getting the experience and we never stop learning. Um, we might do something new next week, but we, we have the creativity to blend that in to our students. And I think that the student, oh, they, they appreciate it so well. And they know that, you know, it sounds sappy, but they know we care. And that helps them build confidence. Um, I think I answered your question. Did I? <laughs> it was great, it was great. Um, I'm gonna go down the, the row here and, and ask everybody the same question because I think with this time we're in, we're able to see these webinars and, and we're, I think all of us are able to spend a little bit more time thinking about people that we'd wanna go learn something else from. Um, I'm just gonna go down there. I'm gonna ask you, uh, you have the opportunity to fly, which is that's a rare treat now, but one day I suppose we'll be able to do that again, but you can fly anywhere and spend one day watching somebody coach. I mean, it doesn't have to be a golf coach, but you know, look, what I'm after is all the people watching this, I want to, I want to try to give them some, some thoughts about uh, people that they could go learn from people that aren't in this group. So I want, I want to get your opinion about who you'd go watch coach for a day and why. And I'll start with you, Jason. On, I don't know if it was Netflix or Amazon Prime. I'm just going to say Amazon Prime. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not speaking a great American language. So uh, for, for us Brits, uh, the game of cricket, I guess probably most similar to your game of baseball. Um, cricket is uh, obviously a very prominent game with the Commonwealth countries. And uh, there's an Australian coach, uh, former player, uh, Australian national team player called Justin Langer, who uh, really got the Australian team from a pretty bad situation. Uh, they had two of their key players uh, were banned for cheating. Um, there's a whole controversy. You can kind of read that up on this on, on the web. Um, but anyway, there was an unbelievable fly on the wall documentary, which went with the whole team for about a year and a half, two years, literally from the moment that Justin Lang was appointed head coach of the Australian team um, and how he got his players back to the, the roots of uh, um, being uh, better people, better foundation, and then obviously building the, the team up on all levels, both from a technical standpoint to a mental standpoint. So yeah, I'd, I'd love to spend a day with him, uh, pick his mind a little bit more from what I've seen on TV. And um, yeah, I think it'd be a good thing that maybe even if you don't understand the game of cricket, I think as coaches developing to try and understand and get in sort of Justin Langer's shoes, all the challenges and the highs and lows that you had to go through and 
ultimately uh, last year he had quite a good level of success. So um, yeah, he, he'd be the person I'd choose. Let's move over to you, Krista. Who would you go uh, watch uh, coach for a day? I might go, do I get to go back in time? I might go back to Coach Wooden. You know, so much after reading a lot of his books and the teams he put together in his UCLA years and just to sit there and observe and, uh, and watch his magic both as a coach and a communicator and a motivator. Um, you know, and there's one quote I wanted to say that I, I heard Mike say it might have been 26 years ago now, but I'll never forget it. It made a lasting impression in, in my mind as, as a young teacher is the, what really matters in teaching is knowing what to change and what to leave alone, and especially in golf instruction. That's kind of always has, has stuck with me over the years, but um, I would probably pick on that note and then uh, probably go back and watch John Wooden. David, if you can, you can go watch somebody who's good at something for a day, who do you go watch? Bernie Madoff. <laughs> No, I'm kidding. Um, probably Jim Fannin. If I could spend a day with Jim and and just kind of, you know, understand more about how to get people in the zone, you know, how to get people out of their own way, working on the right things, you know, not only myself, but um, I find him brilliant and uh, one of the kindest, most amazing guys I've ever met. Um, and I've spent a little bit of time with him and talked with him on the phone a little bit and, uh, but it'd be probably Jim, um, for what I, um, what I think I would need in my, my skill set. So. Debbie, Debbie, who would you spend the day with? Uh, this, this is like my favorite thing to do. Mike knows. So I, I love to travel and watch other teachers teach and I have done so and I have this huge bucket. Matt, I think you and I have talked about it and yep. I've hit a lot of these guys, some of these guys on this list pre-COVID I was supposed to go hang with this year. But my guy that came to my mind as soon as he said it and I hound him on the range at PGA Tour events and um, I actually sent him a nice note because he did have COVID but it would be Pete Cowan. And um, he's awesome. He's amenable. He answers all my questions. Mike knows. And um, I would love to spend a couple of days with him. Carol, how about you? Who would you pick to spend the day with? Uh, you know, looking at this from a success point of view, and I hate to say it, but I would go spend a day with Nick Saban. <laughs> <laughs> I just... Whatever he's got, I'll take it back and tell Kirby Smart. I just, but the man knows how to win and uh, get respect from his players. So that's who I would spend a day with. Mr. Park, how about you? Who would you pick for your, your day of learning? <laughs> Actually, uh, two of them. Uh, one is Lou Holtz, uh, the football coach. I mean, he's a fantastic uh, motivator. I've uh, been to a couple of his. Um, seminars or they invited him as a guest and he's a, such a motivator and I'd love to have seen how he did that uh, to get the uh, the players to win and, and how do he motivated them and then the second one would be Sir Alex Ferguson for Manchester United um, he's had a fantastic record over the years and um, you know that those are the two outside of golf um, so you know, those two really, uh, could, you could learn something from that. You can actually apply it to your teaching. Tina, who would you pick? So, um, I would, my coach that I'd like to go watch is um, the Patriots coach is Belichick, Coach mm -hmm. Belichick. I'm a big Patriots fan and I would like to watch him coach um, for about a week, actually. I think he motivates his players the way he gets his players to come in and work hard, I think is great. And um, I just went blank on uh, where do we go to the top 100 summit uh, and watch uh, the basketball coach? It was in Duke. Duke. What was his name again? Oh, Mike Krzyzewski. Mike Krzyzewski. Yes, he was awesome. And um, we went in and watched him do his practice sessions and I thought he was phenomenal. And I would love to spend a few days watching him coach his team. Um, 
but I really like coaches that are motivational, that change um, the way players see themselves and can get them to do something different than they actually believed that they could do, that he empowers their players. So um, Pat Summit was somebody that I admired and I loved. And if uh, she were alive, I'd try and spend as much time with her as I possibly could. But um, I really like coaches that are, are strong and are creative and really change who their, their, uh, their players are and make them better. So, Susie, who would you pick? Well, I, I, some of the panel I haven't seen. So that, that has to come first. I know you excluded them, but that's unfair. Uh, so I would love to be able to do that. But Muffet McGraw comes to mind uh, right out of the gate. Would love, love, love to watch her coach, Gina Ariema. Um, I've had an opportunity to watch him coach a little, but certainly would dive into that. Uh, Lou Holtz, absolutely, Andrew. Um, what, so long as you're not giving him a lesson, I've actually given Lou lessons. He does not want to talk about anything to do with his life other than what you're teaching him in the golf swing. And then he just nods at you and ignores you. So um, Lou, <laughs> wonderful, wonderful man, but you got to take him to lunch or something for him to chat with you about that. Um, but he loves, loves golf. But there's just, I have such an extensive list as does Debbie, as does probably all of us, because um, I find so much um, joy in understanding coaching philosophy uh, from people from all over the world. I love the archives of the United States Olympic Committee. I love the videos uh, that I can watch who have developed the most elite athletes ever. Um, and those are, are archived there. So, I mean, I, I would take up far too much time, but my goal would be to whomever is watching, um, you can learn from a great teacher that your child has had a coach who has, you know, 38 five-year-olds in their room and somehow manage them better than I can manage two on right. a putting green. Um, so, I mean, at the end of the day, like, I, I don't know that you have to seek out these uh, names. Uh, remember that people right in your community are probably tremendous business leaders who are also coaches um, and, and seek them out locally where you can just drive and have lunch with them. Yeah, and if you didn't know that before, not, we, I have an 11-year-old, an 8-year-old, and a 6-year-old, and having them home and doing school here gives you a whole new appreciation for what elementary school teachers do, that's for sure. Uh, Kevin, who would you pick to spend the day with? Um, I think, you know, <clears throat> there's so many interesting people on the planet, and I, one of the things I've become interested in is things that are outside of golf. I think we know golf probably – at a level that very few people do that's particularly this you know the the people in this group so i start looking outside of of golf to try to kind of figure out things that we can bring in that that, that will allow us to expand our thinking so i've been recently exploring the um um exploring things like culture success culture things like that so the new zealand all blacks have been fascinating to me for a while i'd love to go spend a day with them watch them train uh one of the more successful sporting organizations in the world that uh based almost exclusively on their culture according to their um, to the things i've heard about it uh jerry lynch if you haven't heard about jerry jerry's one of the very cool people on the planet i had had some exposure to him but i need to spend more time with him um and tom house i think tom is a is a really bright guy and can bring a lot to uh, i've spent i've spent it's a little bit of time with them, but I've, I need to spend more. I mean, there's a couple of those people that, that, you know, you go spend some time with and you go just, you leave thinking, okay, <clears throat> that was great, but I need, I want more of that. So uh, those are the people that are on kind of my, on my current grid. And um, so that's, that's where I, that's where I would go. Those are great ones. Rob, where would you spend your day? That's uh, this is the hardest question I've asked. Uh, there's so many great teachers out there. Um, if uh, I'll just do it in context quickly, if I wanted to study how something about teaching tour players, I'd, I'd like to spend some time with Pete Cowan. If I wanted to spend more time talking about uh, a good broad cross section and what, observing something, it would be Terry Rolls. Uh, he would be my, my first pick. And then uh, in junior coaching, uh, you know, I'd, I'd, like, I'd like to see uh, Jason Floyd teach. Uh, uh, I've been watching his stuff for a few years and uh, there's so many. It's just it's just a really hard question. There isn't enough time to do that. That that would be my answer. I also I'm like I'm like uh, also I go outside. Most of the learning, you know, I've been asked this before. Most of the learning I do is outside of golf. 
that helps me become a better coach. Um, there's really very few people. When you break it down, if you look at this group and you look at you look at my world, which is primarily junior development, long-term junior development, uh, I have a couple of guys on tour that have developed, but in, in, uh, there's very few people that are res you can go to as resources. Like we're kind of breaking ground here with, uh, with what we're doing with kids these days. And, uh, you know, but the, the forums are also a great source. So I have to credit Facebook. Facebook has just been an enormous influence on, on teaching and teachers. Terry, Terry, who would you go spend the day with? Um, so I'm going to answer in two different ways. I'm going to re respond to David and say it would be an innovator. Uh, secondly, it would be a, a team sport because, you know, us dealing with players on a daily basis, we're mostly dealing with one, two, three, four, five people. And the fact that the great coaches like Alec Ferguson that Andrew Park mentioned can adapt their, their style, you know, on the fly to 20 different people who are all, you know, being paid a tremendous amount of money and are not motivated by that, but by, you know, different reasons. I think that's an unbelievable thing. But the number one that I would go to would be uh, Arsene Wenger, who completely revolutionized uh, the Premier League soccer in bringing in sports scientists and nutrition and measuring, uh, you know, physical performance, things like that. So he, he changed the, the nature and, you know, as a foreigner, he didn't have a great reputation. You know, he wasn't famous before he went to, to the team, but he managed to make a massive cultural overhaul within the context of a lot of players delivered success and, you know, over a relatively short period of time. So it's, it's pretty unbelievable to, that's like the, the, the level of skills you need to do that are, are off the chart in my opinion. And uh, that, that's a good segue. I, uh, Let me tell. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> oh, you. <laughs> well, you know, I'm a, uh, I've been fortunate. I've, um, I got to spend a lot of time with Charlie Lau. Charlie Lau is the greatest hitting coach that ever lived. And watching him work with uh, hitters and transform them into batting champions. Um, when Tina talked about Mike Chichesky, that day we spent there was unbelievable. Ed Ibargan took us there and we watched and Duke ended up winning the national championship that year. Uh, Dean Smith and uh, Larry Brown. I mean, I gave Larry Brown lots of golf lessons and I spend more time talking to him about uh, coaching than I do about what he needs to do with his golf swing. Uh, I mean, he's brilliant. A guy wins an NBA championship, ABA championship and an NCAA title. Pretty smart guy. Um, Jim Fannin, brilliant. Uh, when he talks, you got to stand there uh, with a bucket because gold is spilling out of his mouth. It's unbelievable the stuff that comes out of his mouth. Um, anybody who teaches golf has not spent time uh, watching David Ledbetter or Butch Harmon or Jim Hardy or Jim McLean or Chuck Cook or Randy Smith or um, you know watching any of them teach is missing out huge. Uh, there's a there's a little known teacher who's put seven players who work with him as juniors on the PGA Tour, um, and nobody knows who he is. But uh, Patrick uh, Cantley uh, lives by him, and he's made him them phenomenal. That's a guy by the name Jamie Mulligan, spectacular teacher, great communicator, and the things he's doing are making. Uh, people a lot better. I would love to spend a lot more time. Um, I mean, I spend tons of time with Terry, but I would like to spend more time with Kevin Kirk. Um, I would like to spend more time with DJ Trollio, who produces unbelievable junior players. Also, uh, you know, just watching the way they do things. Jerry King, unbelievable teacher, makes everybody better. Um, so there are lots of people I would like to spend more time with. And those of you who are looking for things to do, follow those people around and listen. Plus, follow the people on the panel. I have one more thing. Susie, take us in the direction of what uh, you and I were talking about this morning with the PGA. Susie is a brilliant lady who's leading the PGA in, in, in the correct direction. And tell, her, tell them what you, we talked about with the teaching. 
Yeah, th thanks, Mike. And, and Kevin, shout out to you for being so incredibly instrumental in this with us. Uh, we developed a coaching committee. Uh, Trillium Rose is the chair of that for me. And certainly this isn't about one person doing it. It's about an incredible team doing it, our player development department as well. But we've had our coaching committee, which is made up not only of PGA professionals and LPGA professionals, but also from scientists around the world. Um, as we don't want it to be subjective, we want this to be research-based and data-based uh, alongside of experience-based. Um, we have a huge mix of people on that committee who have gone through all of our education programs, starting at the PGA Associate and PGM University levels. And what we're really proud of, certainly we're gonna keep working on it and ensure that it's at the highest quality for the highest skill level we can provide. Um, the material in there now uh, is backed up by scientific evidence. And again, thanks to uh, PGA.coach, which is our ADM model, which uh, Kevin's been really instrumental in, in supporting and ensuring that we get out as we had uh, as an Olympic sport, which we're thrilled about. But, you know, athletic training and junior development is critical uh, to do it in the correct way based on body movement types uh, and abilities. And we want children to love the game for a lifetime. I think maybe Carol said it first. Um, you know, this isn't about just developing tour players as the coach. And, and while we all want, maybe we don't all want, but I think a lot of us would get a great thrill if one of our students, you know, was holding up the Wanamaker or won the KPMG Women's PGA Championship. Um, but we all realize that, you know, very few people get to do that. And so the goal should be to develop golfers for a lifetime. And I'm proud of that committee. I'm proud of the PGA of America for really turning the tide in instruction and coaching. Um, as I said, we're not going to stop. We're going to continue to work to make it a uh, best led program, we hope, um, around the world. Thanks. Excellent. It's almost like you're, uh, is, is Zoom letting you eavesdrop in my uh, list of questions? Because the next question I was going to ask you, Susie, is, if you could yeah. unilaterally add one thing to the PGA curriculum, and it, I think it's equally applicable to the LPGA curriculum, but what's the, what's the one class you would add tomorrow if you could add it? And you probably can add it, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, you know, I, I think it's what I just uh, mm -hmm. highlighted, and probably a little self-serving because I'm, I love, love the junior development space. Um, but it's also cradle to grave, right? We needed a program that helped develop athletes, uh, whether they were very young or whether they came to us at 65 years old and, and one that made sense for the coach that stood in front of them and for the consumer we were trying to attract and be a part of the game. We want everybody to feel like they're a part of this game. Um, we're not there yet. We have a lot of work to do to get there. We have 25 million people playing the game, uh, but we know there's just so many more that have raised their hand and said, boy, man, I'd, I'd really like to do that, um, but I don't even know where to start or how. And, and that's why we developed uh, this ADM model. Uh, we certainly didn't develop it. This was alongside of allied associations around the world, including the United States Olympic Committee, the LPGA, the tours. Um, so this isn't just the PGA of America's uh, drive. It, it's all of our drives. We're gonna be better unified. We're gonna be better together. Uh, we all on this panel, um, have learned from each other, which raises all boats, um, and that's really the intent. So to add something, it would have really been to have kind of the scientific-based evidence uh, that now we can have based on technology, continue that process, make sure everything we're doing to Mike and Terry's point, they're ahead of the curve. If we're going to say it, we have to be able to prove it, um, and, and that's where I hope we continue to head. Excellent. I'm going to go to uh, you, Jason. Um, you uh, you coach in Europe, and I'm sure that there are plenty of uh, students you have where either English is their second language, or the language that you're communicating is in is the second language for them. Uh, how what have you learned about nonverbal communication as a coach, and how has that helped you coach uh, students that where you might even be speaking the same language? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, a huge, huge range of uh, kids that we've had across Europe. So as you can imagine, from Christ, from Polish to German speakers to, to French to Greek. I mean, the list goes on. Um, I think what we've seen is, is 
kind of what we've prided ourselves on, which is very much that kind of character development. So uh, there's a sometimes or many times like a lack of confidence sometimes because obviously their, their English is maybe not quite up to scratch. Um, the great thing is that coming to us, they go to an international school. So all of their academic studies are in English. Um, all of our go golf coaches are speaking English uh, to our students. Um, and I think, as you're saying, it's um, there's that great visual, you know, generic way to, to teach people. Um, it's almost like that common language that golf and the golf swing is, is something they understand, whether they're Polish or uh, Swiss or, or whatever they may be. So, you know, very quickly, I think they, they become a little bit more confident. They open up a lot quicker. You know, they, they, their characters develop, I think, in a much better way. Um, you know, and I think that that communication uh, skill gets better a lot quicker. You know, they, they, they get very confident, I think, in a very short period of time. Um, I think their, their whole kind of mental structure, I think, you know, through golf, I think that's one of the, the life skills that golf gives you. One of the many life skills is obviously being able to organize yourself. There's that level of self-discipline, focus, hard work, all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, having that structure, I think, through the game of golf gives that gives them that ability to learn the language a lot more. I think they come out of their shell much more. I think that's another thing that we, you know, we, we see people are a little bit, a little bit timid, a little bit reserved. Um, so I think it's, it's a great, it's a great tool for many things. And then it really spreads over into their education. Educationally, they've become actually much better. Um, you're saying that obviously with your kids at home right now uh, with their homeschooling. Um, you know, it's, uh, I think a big thing, the, worldwide now the challenge is that kids are at home you know most of them i think in some cases left their own devices kids will probably be getting out of bed at 12 o'clock uh midday and then they'll burn their phones with show social media to death i think because they're just pounding away on that thing but uh um you know i, I think now if they're able to be quite disciplined and quite structured um they can really get a lot out of what you were talking before um which is very much using um all of the many forms which are things like coach now um a lot of these a lot of training and communication apps that you can have with your coaches um to really get the most out of the situation so i think communication skills in, in this covid19 uh situation that we're in is is quite a good challenge uh, for a lot of people but uh, golf from what we've seen in the last 10 years of doing this is a, is a great way for language skills and, and communication skills to come out uh, of people to a better level Andrew, uh, you're in the same boat. Uh, you coach a lot of players, all different nationalities, a lot of different languages. How do you uh, how do you uh, sort of coach across cultures? Is that is that part of the allure for you? Is it a challenge? How, how do you how do you see it? Um, yeah, so it can be a challenge at times. It just depends on who's interpreting for you. Uh, sometimes the interpreters don't know all the golf terms. So it can be a little frustrating, but actually what I do is if, if I notice that the interpreter is not using, is not golf, um, not a golfer, I usually just put down the computer, put it in front of them and then show the kids and draw lines and just say, do this and do that. And then they catch on. So they, they I find visual and then showing people like, you know, how to do it through the cameras uh, live feed in front of them uh, is probably the best way to overcome uh, the language barrier. So you, you actually don't need to speak a language uh, to teach golf. Uh, you can just sit there and say, this is good, that's uh, no good. And I found that's been the most, you know, uh, probably the most valuable for me as a teacher in all these different countries, especially going to uh, Asia so um, but uh, you know fortunately I've had a few interpreters that are very good but um, yeah I think you know visual is is everything also uh, if you need to explain something that's more in detail uh, then you you get somebody who's a golfer to explain that so uh, Kevin, this question's for you. Uh, we've all had way too much time inside and on Facebook and on social media, and I'm sure you've seen the, the question get knocked back and forth about whether it's easier, quote unquote, to teach tour players than it is to teach a 20 handicapper. 
you've taught tour players and you've taught 20 handicappers, is it easier to teach someone who can do exactly what you tell them to do or is it harder? Well, I think, you know, everybody's, you know, you're always dealing with a population of one, so there's no recipe or formula. So, you know, every, the 20 handicapper has a, a program design that's appropriate for them and what they're trying to accomplish and the tour players have the same. So it's, it's really about being able to, you know, start with, with on the front end of the process, making sure that you get to know these people well enough. You can figure out specifically what it is they're, they're wanting to try to do and build programming that, that fits their, their time budget uh, their their monetary budget and also um, it, that, that you feel like that they're capable of handling. So I, I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, getting getting all that right is, is really a more of a front end thing, trying to kind of make sure you get things right on the front end. And if so, even through these periods of time where, or they, um, I mean, at our place, we're probably the least affected place on the planet as far as golf goes. Uh, the courses have remained open. Uh, so we have, we're running 225, 230 rounds of golf around our place every day. Um, and people are out taking lessons. So, I mean, as far as us, it's, it's been a, it really has been, a, a, with the exception of just some, an, an inconvenience, the, the, the golf space has remained wide open. So, I, but I think going back to it, I mean, you know, there was a guy named Chris Carmichael who wrote a great book. He was a uh, Lance Armstrong's coach. And he wrote a book called The Time Crunch Golfer. And, you know, if, if you're not under 20, you know, if you're not kind of the, a junior golfer, let's say under 24 or, you know, in your retirement age, then basically by definition, you're time crunched. And so most of the programming we have to take into consideration is not only the, the, the goals of the player, what it is they're trying to do, but their time constraints and making sure that the things we're asking them to do are within reason. And if we can do that, you can take people slowly down a path and, and, uh, a tour, you can, you know, if a if a if your twenty handicapper only has an hour a week to work on it, then we've got to figure out how to how to keep them in the game. And, and like Susie says, we can't, you know, if we can close off all of the exits, uh, and we can keep keep all these people finding some reason to come back to the golf course, uh, it does nothing but benefit all of us. Terry, you want to chime in on that one? Do you what what are, what are the challenges of teaching a tour player compared to teaching the twenty handicapper? And Mike, I'll then you uh -huh. then you can go after Terry. Anyone, uh, anyone who knows me uh, knows I've got a formula for it in terms of, I just look at it in a very binary way. You have, uh, you know, as Kevin said um, very well, that you have to get to know the person, which means you have to get to know the outcome. Um, you have to know the front end, what's, what, what you're going to be looking for, you know, so we do the testing. So you have, you know, almost like two points of information where you say, okay, this is where they're at, they want to get to. How am I going to use my set of, you know, specific technical uh, ingredients and communication ingredients to get them there? And as, as Kevin said, relative to the amount of time they have. So, you know, you have to choose the things that uh, are going to have the biggest bang for the buck uh, if someone's got a limited amount of time. But I think, honestly, you know, there's there's X amount of time that you and the player of any level spend together. You you work out what's the most effective thing for the tour player to improve the score you know, short, medium, and long-term. And then, uh, you know, with the 20 handicapper, obviously, as, as you know, it, I wouldn't say there's always long-term, but sometimes there is. Sometimes people want to get into the things, into, into a longer program. So, you know, for me, it, it's really just boxes in my brain. You know, this is where we're at. This is what needs to get done. Um, you know, this is where we need, get, need to get to. And it, it pretty much has a similar mindset, honestly, with all humans so you know we're, we're teaching humans and then the outcomes are, are different so i think you know communication between you and the student uh understanding of what's the best use of time i mean those are the really important commonalities i would say mike you've given more lessons than maybe anyone on the planet uh, how would you uh, compare the, the 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 attention and detail that goes into teaching a tour player to the 20 handicapper. I think regardless of who you're working with, you have to play a, pay a lot of attention and detail. I mean, uh, I videotape their lessons. Uh, I, have, I, I screen every student to make sure I know what they're working on. Um, I mean, you have to treat them like they're the most important person on the planet. 
and you have to give them um, your total undivided attention. Uh, the hard part of teaching is, is that um, the lesson's really done in about 10 minutes. You've fixed them, you've made the changes, and the whole thing is, is not giving them more information to make them worse. So you gotta spend the rest of the, uh, that hour, 50 minutes, coaching them. And it doesn't matter whether they're a tour player or a 25 handicapper, you need to coach them and help them to create the fields and lead them in the right direction. I rarely spend three lessons in a row giving a golf swing lesson. If once I get them hitting it the way I want to hit them, want them to hit it, we go to the golf course. The golf course is, I mean, basically it tells us, it's a litmus test that tells us exactly what's happening out there. So we get to get get to see what they're doing out there because a lot of times what they do on the, go on the range is not the same as the golf course. So that doesn't matter, once again, whether it's a tour player or a 20, 25 handicapper. I want to see how they manage themselves out there, what they do, and what is it that's preventing them from playing their best golf. This question is for Carol and for Debbie. I'll let, Carol, why don't you go first? Um, we spent a lot of time the last two weeks talking about uh, one size fits all instruction and how instruction, uh, there's, there are good tips. Uh, and I, I guess every tip is good, but not every tip is good for every player. I wanted to ask you when, when someone comes to your uh, lesson T for the first time, uh, what would you say is the, is the biggest myth that a, that a, that a student is coming to you with? God, there are so many, pick one. <laughs> I think, um, I find that keeping the left arm straight and trying to keep it parallel to the target line is a huge myth because when most people hear the word straight, they process it into locking their elbow and then they can't do anything from there. And I think another one um, uh, is, oh, I've got to, it's trendy now. I got to lay the shaft. I got to get up there and lay that shaft down. And most people don't even know where their swing plane is. So that's, that's another reason why BioSwing Dynamics is a fabulous system to be able to explain to each person where they need to be based on the way they're built. Excellent. Debbie, how about you? Uh, it's a good question. I think I agree with Carol. There's a host of, of things that people come to me with. I think some are that they feel that they have to hit the ball straight to play well, that they have to hit the ball perfectly all the time to play good golf um and i do believe what i said in the beginning of of the talk that in some instances watching the tour and not being able to discern that that this is entertainment and we're dealing with the best players in the world that there's a different set of rules for the other population and i think trying to break that apart so that you just view it as entertainment and these people play at a level that is just not in our realm of possibilities to break that apart and then to be able to say, now let's work on you and what you need yeah. to the nth degree to get them to play the best that they can be, which is in no way going to be perfect. So dispelling all of that. That's an excellent point. I like that. Um, I think we're gonna do one more circuit around the room before we open it up to questions for everyone. And um, I think I, I see this as kind of the reverse elevator pitch, right? So instead of somebody coming and pitching something to you, if you're stuck in an elevator for two minutes with uh, one of the coaches who are watching this from around the world, and you're gonna give them a quick piece of advice that's gonna help them in the beginning stages of their, or their intermediate stages of their career, what would, what would be that piece of advice? And uh, I'll start with uh, I'll start with you, Rob. Uh, piece of advice you'd give uh, your your reverse elevator pitch. Be more concerned with helping the individual than how much money you're going to make from them. Um, be show real passion, real concern. Real, cons real, cons real concern. Um, am I okay here? Am I okay here? Something just happened with my screen. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I would say. Uh, I would say uh, if I were to go to 
start, start over again, knowing what I know today. And I, I didn't, I, I was in an area where I didn't have any clients. Uh, I would go to the owner of a, the best driving range in town and I would give him five or $10,000 in hundred dollar gift certificates and ask him to give these to his uh, customers as a way of appreciating them. Not, not to cut in on any, uh, anyone else's business, but there's an awful lot of people there that are not taking lessons and they're practicing. And so that would be a way to get yourself known in a hurry. Uh, people say, well, wow, why should I teach for free? I guarantee you that any of the teachers on this panel, if you did that for 90 days, you'd have a book of 60 regular weekly lessons if you wanted to do them, because you're that good at, at, at making change in people and influencing them. So don't, uh, don't be afraid to invest in yourself and look, think long-term, buy technology, uh, <laughs> invest in yourself, and uh, it'll pay off in the long run. Susie, uh, how about you? What, what's your reverse elevator pitch? Uh, I know you've got, you've got uh, daughters that are college age, right? Or just finishing up college. If, if they're going to go into coaching, what kind of advice are you giving them? Aren't you nice? My daughters are both out of college, but we'll just say they're still there. <laughs> um, I, you know, the first thing I would say to a very young coach is take more behavioral science classes, take some psychology classes, take some sociology classes, because you're trying to change behavior when you're a coach. Um, and those things I wish I had done more of. Uh, I would then say, because I, I really believe it, but uh, everybody's going to nod their head and roll their eyes, uh, become a member of the PJ of America. Uh, so that we can provide you with the resources and tools and you can meet the type of people that are on this panel. Um, my mentors and people who helped me along the way are people who I met through the PGA of America and the LPGA TNCP. And, and I cherish those friendships and relationships, but I also um, cherish the fact that they're willing to share information with me. So don't be afraid to reach out. Don't be afraid to join uh, one of those associations uh, so that you can build your network. And, and have a network that supports you in good times and supports you in times where you're trying to learn. And then I would finally say, I would just echo what was already said, you know, you cannot stop learning. Um, anytime uh, you wanna do anything, it, it should be, well, I'm not quite there yet. And, uh, but I'm gonna continue to drive and strive to get there. I can say in my 28 years of coaching and, and teaching, um, I'm always fascinated by, more by what I don't know uh, than what I do know. Um, but for me, bottom line, it's about the person standing in front of you. It's about them believing you are hundred percent with them in the moment you're with them. Um, and when that's the case, uh, your book will fill. David, you're talking to somebody who's trying to come into the golf business. What kind of advice are you giving them? Well, you know, I think apart from learning, you know, the skill sets of like bio swing dynamics or, you know, learning the golfing machine, learning the mechanical parts, um, because I think everybody has to know the mechanical scenarios. Um, if I if I had to give advice to a young teacher, it would be to make what a person sees to be real and what they feel to be real. That's your job. That's our job. It's not it's not to sit there and say, "Hey, jump in my sandbox." It's for us to climb in their sandbox and play, make sandcastles with them. You know, it's like they they. You're, it's our job is like Susie said is to become a behaviorist. I think. Um, too many times we're a lot of golf pros I see they, they think they're the rock star and it's like um, th that person that we're working with we have to we have to totally understand how they process information I think that's to be a great teacher is to understand you know how a person sees the world that they live in and that, that's the one thing I've been fortunate with with putter fitting and that's what's taught me this is I can, I can change something in a, in a putter and change an aim response. So my job is to not say, hey, aim straight. It's to say, what, how do they process what they're looking at? And so I, I think through that whole process, I've learned to, to think, um, how do I change their behavior? How do I change what they see? How do I change what they, what they feel? So that's our job as, as coaches, is to, to totally become a behaviorist rather than a teacher, um, in my opinion. I mean, you change their behavior, you, they've learned, right? So um, that's, 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 the, that's where I want to live. So, you know, Mike, Mike has uh, given me and Terry and, and EA have given the, this uh, a tremendous tool set. I had the golfing machine, you know, I had a book that had, you know, 11 to 24 components. I mean, it had 24 components and 11 to you know, 11 pot potential combinations within each one of those. And 
and I learned the book, but I didn't know how to teach. So, you know, um, Mike has obviously given us a, a platform to have, to become behaviorists and, and change how someone feels and how their body actually works. So I, it, that'd be what I'd tell a young kid. That's what I tell them is become a behaviorist. That's great advice. Uh, Krista, you want to go next? Uh, what, what's your reverse elevator pitch to the person trying to figure it out on this business? Um, kind of piggybacking David's there. Um, I spent a lot of time with Jennifer Monroe, who's a top personality profiler who's done per in Palm Beach. And um, she has a great book, book, new book that came out recently. I would look that up, Personally, Personality Matters. Um, so as us as teachers to be a chameleon for our students, we've got to adapt to them and being able to read them right when they walk up to you and adapt our style to match theirs, not thinking that they have to fit into our world, right? Kind of like what David was talking. So um, I think that's huge because that communication is, is kind of everything. Um, also back on my quote from Mike, knowing what to change and what to leave alone. You know, I think you have to anticipate what you're gonna say as a teacher and understanding ball flight and impact and how what's gonna come out of your mouth, how that's gonna impact what the club is doing to the ball and knowing that ahead of time. So you don't have a lot of surprises. So you can anticipate what you think the ball is gonna do, how the student might react might be a little different, but it makes you accountable as a teacher to the information that you're giving to your students. So really having a clear understanding of ball flight and impact Test, don't guess. Obviously, the info on bioswing dynamics, why we're all here, is just so invaluable. And really understanding the person in front of you and their personality. That's terrific. Uh, Kevin, uh, maybe uh, give us some insight. Maybe somebody wound up with a, a player who's a great college player or someone who's uh, getting ready to go out on tour and they don't know what to do. What kind of advice are you giving them about how to navigate some of that water? Uh, you know, I always start with uh, with kids that are in that profile by just sitting them down and, and, and getting caught up on their on their their life story, getting, getting me up to speed with with their, you know, uh, their golf story, their life story and try to figure out first off where they've been. Um, and the second thing that I, I, I really spend quite a bit of time is, is trying to help them be very intentional about what they're where they're trying to get to. Um, you know, if you got a kid that wants to play college golf, well, what, let's talk about what that means. You know, is it, is it, uh, you want to be a division one player? You want to be a, uh, you know, you happy to, you know, let's, 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 let's kind of drill down on that and try to kind of figure out a little bit more what it means. If it's a, if it's a young aspiring professional who wants to kind of play on the tour, well, you know, being on the tour is not enough. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta move past that. You gotta get more specific. And so I really try to spend a lot of time trying to help them just narrow down their intention because I do believe that intention behavior follows intention. So if, if we can get somebody, you know, the, the trouble with somebody just being on tour is, is that intention manifests. They'll be on the tour, off the tour, on the tour, off the tour, on the tour, off the tour. And I can promise you that that's like purgatory. Nobody wants to live in that space. So um, if you have some, a kid that's got some talent, okay, let's, uh, you know, let's sit down and, and talk. Do you think you have the capacity and the bandwidth and are willing to do the work to be a top 50 player in the world, a top hundred player in the world? Let's get specific. And then we can kind of move, start figuring out what are the, the metrics that go along with that and then start moving ourselves, figure out where you are and figure out how to close the gap. So to me, it's about, it's really about just getting caught up with their life story and then helping them narrow down very specifically an intention about where they're trying to go. Uh, Tina, you were in that space. You, you were a player and you moved on to be a teacher. Um, what kind of advice uh, do you have either for a coach who's trying to help somebody? I mean, you understand the, the playing mindset, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of advice do you give for coaches on how to communicate that across the, across the, 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 the space between player and coach? Um, I think that the big, you know, I, I have this motto. I always say, pay attention to your intentions. And I think I use that in my coaching as well as, as playing. And I think, um, Kevin, I think you hit right on it because if, if we pay attention to our intention, um, as, as coaches teaching players that want to go out on tour, um, they're going to be very much more aware of what they want to do. So if they set their goals ahead of, uh, in, in order to what they want to do and they stay on task to that, I think they're going to be much more 
successful. Um, I've been sitting here just thinking about me as a coach and what I would tell another coach or a player that wants to go out on tour. And I would just say to be passionate for yourself and, or, and be true to yourself and, and work hard and continue to learn and, and use your experiences out there and learn from them because it's so easy as a player to go out there and say, oh, I didn't make it or I'm playing bad and not use your experiences as a learning experience and then take them as I did anyway. And, and I got upset with myself because I was trying to be such a perfectionist. Um, and I didn't use my learning experiences on tour um, to learn from them. And I just, I got mad or I got upset at myself and as good of a player as I was, I just kept beating myself up because I wasn't perfect at it all the time. So I think sometimes we have to take those learning curves and get better from them. And as a coach, I would, I would really work really hard with players that want to play out there to do that um, and train them better to do that. Uh, love what you lo love, what you do and make sure you love it because if you don't love it, you're not going to sustain yourself out there, uh, whether you're teaching or playing. Um, I conflict all the time because I went from a player to a teacher and Mike always tells me that teaching, you know, playing is not my God anymore. And I'll go play in an event. I don't play very well in it. And he just says, Tina, you haven't played in 25 years. You know, what do you expect? I'm 10 hours on the lesson T for the last 20 years, but you know, it's knowing what fits and what doesn't fit. So, um, you know, teaching young players uh, that want to go out on tour, it's a lifestyle, it's a lifestyle change, and you really have to be able to travel and live in that suitcase and, and really love that lifestyle. Um, so I think just teaching them and explaining to them what it really takes to be out there and really be comfortable with who you are and make sure that you train those players to really love who they are so that they can handle whatever happens out there. Uh, They'll be able to be, they'll be able to be successful and play great golf. Uh, Excellent. Uh, yeah. A Andrew, how about you? Uh, what kind of uh, advice are you giving to the beginner intermediate coach? Um, so the best thing is, as I learned once, you know, giving as many lessons as possible. Uh, you can't learn. Uh, you can't learn enough. And and to echo a few of the others that. Um, you know, when it comes to teaching, be learn from the others, uh, learn from other teachers, go watch how they teach. And then when it comes to, um, you know, comes to practice doing, you know, going through the steps, uh, try to have an order that you use, you know, basically how you're going to approach the student, ask them what they want, learn their, if they're an auditory person, visual, uh, feel, understand the person before you you uh, get into, you know, tackling the swing and that. And then uh, secondly, ask them their goals. What is their complete goals for the future? And so then you can go down those uh, steps. But uh, you'll learn this a lot just through teaching hundreds and hundreds of people. I mean, there's nothing more than experience. So that's my advice to you know uh, new teachers. Carol, Carol, what kind of advice would you offer? Um, I would I would tell them to you know, obviously learn as much as you can, but be aware of try to be aware of the top methods out there because if your student comes to you and is trying stack and tilt or trying something that led better's a swing you need to have enough information and education to know what it is and be respectful when you talk about it because if you don't know if you can't answer that student's questions on the methods then you sh you really should say well you know what maybe i'll go find out about that but you've got to be aware of what's out there because i know there's a lot out there but you need to be aware of it and um you know, people do things differently than you do. So you may find your coaching niche. I remember in 2010, I was scared to death and I went up to Hamilton Farms when Mike had, I think it was one of the first Cracker Barrel sessions with Bioswing Dynamics. And I was like, oh my God, this is it. This is so student centered. And I, I found something that I could latch onto and to, to improve my teaching. 
And I guess the other thing I would say is don't be afraid to make mistakes because that is how you learn. And we all talk about the lessons that we gave 10, 20, 30 years ago and how we'd love to go back and change things. But as, as Andrew said, you've got to get out there and teach and don't be afraid to make mistakes. You can always go back and correct them. Jason, uh, how about uh, business advice? What kind of, uh, what kind of uh, advice would you give somebody? Uh, what holes would you uh, give, uh, get them to uh, avoid stepping in and ones that you might've stepped in as a, <laughs> as a beginning teacher? Yeah, I've definitely stepped in a few, that's for sure. Um, I think speaking from personal experience, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a golf professional, a uh, golf teacher. Um, I'm not a businessman. I know how to run my business, but there's a difference between being a businessman and that. So um, I think I've been very fortunate over the years. Uh, and I think as golf coaches, uh, I think we do have the privilege of, uh, as you heard stories from Mike and Terry uh, and the others of, you know, you, you get to meet a lot of people. Um, so I think through that, you know, I personally have met a lot of people who have helped me, who've been very successful in all the other walks of life. Um, Currently, uh, I wear this guy's uh, logo on, on, on my shirt here, but uh, I've got a friend of mine who I met 10 years ago who's a self-made multimillionaire by the age of about 22. Um, and, and the business advice that he's given me, well, starting 10 years ago to where we are today has just been invaluable, uh, quite amazing. Um, so I think, yeah, definitely seek out uh, people who are no, more knowledgeable than yourself. I think that's business-wise, and I think that's certainly coaching. Um, you know, there's, there's so many people out there, you know, I was fortunate obviously when I was young to work for David Ledbetter, that's how I met the likes of Terry and, and obviously Andrew and a whole, other, a whole host of other great coaches that are kind of in that era, um, which then kind of, it's like a tree, isn't it? It kind of, you know, somebody knows somebody, obviously Mike, uh, uh, obviously Terry knew Mike and, and, and so on and so on. So, you know, I think, uh, just having your radars out the whole time, um, being useful with your contacts. Um, and I, I think probably the other thing going back to, which you didn't ask me that question um, per se, but I think one of the biggest things for young coaches is to be very passionate and very driven at all times. Don't, don't think about when you're on the lesson T, okay, it's like a production line, I'm gonna get my whatever, $50, $100, $200, whatever you're charging. Um, give it your all in every session. Everybody should be you could be, I think, I think a lot of us as golfers, um, we play junior golf. I think a lot of us as coaches, maybe um, to, to a good level, we're very competitive animals. Um, so kind of get that competitive instinct and that drive that's within you to give the best lesson that you can give. So when you go home at the end of the day, you, you actually kind of, you'll sit in the car and you're, you're going, yes, I nailed it. I really got that person, whether it's a beginner or to a tour player, it, uh, it shouldn't matter. Uh, I think that should be your goal on every session. Debbie, I think I know how you're going to answer this question because we've Wait, talked about it an, awful, an awful lot through the years. Uh, uh, what, what would you suggest a, a coach do to go out and get better? I would say be open to bio-individuality. Uh, something that Butch and Jim always told me was go see teachers that you don't agree with. Um, start to question a lot, understand muscle and joint function, and um, just continue and be a voracious learner in the most humble and uh, most humble way possible, I think. Yeah, and uh, as uh, I think the more, the more uh, coaches you can go watch who you might not agree with, I mean, that's I think the, the the arguments that get started in this business out, out of uh, misinterpretation, uh, personality disputes. I think just just by seeing what somebody else does, that's a, that's got to be a huge benefit. I would think. Uh, Susie, did you want to uh, weigh in at all about uh, the 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 business side of this uh, advice that you want to give uh, people in the beginning of their career or the, or the middle of their career about uh, about the business of teaching? Yeah, I think for anybody, right? I, it, I don't even think it matters whether it's the beginning, the middle, the end. I find that oftentimes we're service-minded heart. We're doing what we're passionate about. All of us got into the sport because we loved it and we give back and we give back a lot to charity and to community and the people around us. I think too, we have to remember this is a revenue generating business. And as an instructor, most of our instructors' goals is to generate revenue for the facility where they work or for their own academy 
or for an owner. And I think you really have to keep that in mind when you're a business entity. You have to remember what, what does the value for your customer look like? And as we come out of COVID-19, while we have this enormous opportunity to engage a community that perhaps has never played the game and to re-energize those who maybe have left the game and are looking for an open space to come back to, as social distancing is kind of what golf is about, we also have to keep in mind how we're delivering that product to give them value because people aren't just going to come and just throw money at all of us uh, when they can come outside their door. So at the end of the day, they've been, they've been really not spending money for the past eight weeks. We want to get them back to that. This is our livelihood. We have families to take care of. And I find oftentimes our professionals forget that and devalue their expertise and devalue uh, the opportunity they have in front of them. So I'd say it's a perfect time if you're new or in the middle of your career or struggling uh, with customers to start a coaching program. Make sure you're getting paid 24 seven by doing something interactive with somebody online. Um, it is not irresponsible of you to charge. Just make sure you're delivering a value that those people think is a value. You're offering experience that brings them back. Retention is everything. And make sure you're looking at your business model. You sh everybody should be going right through their business plan as we speak with time at home, deciding what still works, what doesn't work, evolving it, reinv reinvigorating it, um, and ensuring that you have products that customers are going to be looking for as they come back outside their house. If you do not, you will be left behind. They will choose something else. And I think it's really important. We're not just coaches. Um, you are a business and you are a business that's continuing to have people come to the facility where they are. I absolutely think coaching is one of the most integral parts of our industry. It is what drives fun. It was drive rounds. Um, and you are the leader of that, but you have to be a business leader in it as well. It's a great point. Uh, Mike and Terry, it's a good way to uh, tie a bow on this. If you want to uh, come in and talk a little bit about, uh, I mean, the whole, the whole point of this, this process over the last two weeks is to help people get better at all aspects of their coaching. And I think this, uh, these elements are just crucial. The, the mixing of the, of the business, the mixing of the technology, the mixing of the knowledge. Uh, Mike, you want, you want to talk a little bit about what, what you'd like to tell a 25 year old you? <laughs> 25 year old me. Um, well, number one, invest in yourself. Invest in yourself by going to see the best teachers in the world, follow them around and learn everything you can from them. Invest in yourself by buying technology. Uh, you need to have, I mean, force plates, uh, ball flight monitors like TrackMan and FlightScope, uh, 3D, all those things will make you a better teacher. Invest in yourself by uh, reading everything you can on uh, not just the subject of golf, but on the subject of humans, understanding how they take information in, the psychology and everything, uh, and invest in yourself. Uh, I mean, Susie just gave, what she just said was brilliant, should be said to everybody uh, who's trying to get into business. Uh, really, really commit to the student uh, when, uh, when you're working. Commit to the people that you're working for. Um, just learn, never stop learning. Like I told my, uh, everybody last time, I mean, my, my dad told me I had two eyes, two ears and one mouth. So I should listen and watch twice as much as I, as I talk because uh, the valuable, there's a lot of valuable information out there. We simply open our eyes and ears and take it all in. And this is a great panel. We learned some great things uh, today. Terry, I'll give you the last word. Uh, any, any advice you want to leave the, the folks who, who've uh, listened to this today? Well, I think the big takeaway is, uh, uh, you know, we've got some of the most successful coaches in the history of golf with us. And to, to a person, um, they said that learning about human beings is, is the thing that they, they want to do. I was very lucky. Um, you know, I can look back at my career and say, you know, the turns that it took for the better are always in conjunction with meeting somebody else. So I think if you just say, you know, talk to people, I mean, we have incredible students as well. Right? I always uh, enjoy meeting some of the most interesting people on the tee. But, um, you know, looking, you know, 2001, 2002, uh, you know, I, I went outside of golf and, you know, one of the best times that I had was, uh, was a guy called John Grinder, who was the founder of uh, NLP. And, you know, he was very kind to really mentor me. And that, 
change the direction that my career took in terms of dealing with human beings. And there's so many different ways to, to do that. Now, because everyone said that, I am going to say on a technical basis, you know, what we went out to do those last two weeks is to try and unmuddy some of the water that exists in the, in the world of golf instruction. Um, you know, people tend to go down rabbit holes of, you know, this is going to work with everybody kind of thing. So I think as a young, young instructor, knowing that things work, um, but, you know, having an acuity of, of knowing that it's not working and you need to go in a different direction. And if you haven't got that different direction, you know, like, like everyone said, seeking out someone with experience to talk about those difficulties is, is a really important thing. So I think, you know, having mentors in and out of golf is obviously terrifically important, but, um, you know, also being honest as a golf teacher and, and knowing that, you know, sometimes you don't know the answers and, and go and look for them. There's plenty of people out there. There's a ton of information and you know try and try and just do the best you can all the time really is what um i think the message comes across i think everyone in this uh in this panel shares that trait that you know the person in front of them is 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 really important you don't know you know i think mike should finish with this neil diamond story you never know who uh who's <laughs> with you and you do your best develop a relationship help them achieve their goals and you never know uh you know where it goes so mike I was teaching in Aspen, and uh, there's a gentleman, uh, Neil, and his son, Micah, who showed up uh, every Thursday morning and took a golf lesson. And after about four weeks, I turned to Neil, and I said, so, Neil, uh, what business are you in? He says, I'm in the music business. And I said, cool. Uh, I said, do you produce? Uh, what do you do? He says, well, I do some producing. But he says, uh, what I do is really perform. I said, really? You ever performed with anybody big? And he says, well, I'm kind of big. I said, really? Um, have I heard anything you sung? And he breaks into sweet Caroline. And I go, you're Neil Diamond? Well, Neil isn't very tall and he's bald. Uh, he wears a hair hat and uh, he looks bigger than life on the stage. And I said, you're one of my favorites. He says, obviously not that much. So uh, it doesn't matter who's in front of you. I mean, I've been fortunate but I've had five presidents step on my lesson tee and learned a ton. Some of the top CEOs in the world. But uh, I've had great information from uh, grandmothers. And uh, I have a lady that uh, runs the uh, Napa Valley Reserve. Her name is uh, Carol Northleet. And she gave me some incredible in, uh, advice. You know, she's so enthusiastic. I said, you're Carol, you're the most enthusiastic person I am. She said, because I love what I do. And as long as you love what you do, it isn't work. And Mike loves what she does too. She has a <laughs> yes, wine <I> club. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all. Thanks, thanks to everyone on the panel. It's, thank uh, you very much. Thanks, Matt. Sure. And it's, a, it's always great to see everybody. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to the time when we can all get together in person. So let's try to do this next time live in person. Sounds good. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you. Be well. Yeah.